Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the uh, Dr. Robert Meyerberg Endowed Lecture in Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, which was established in 2011 through a fundraising campaign to support an annual lecture here at the University of Miami. Uh, former fellows and several grateful patients donated to the Endowed Fund, which provides the means to bring our lecture to you today. Uh, just so that everybody knows, Dr. Meyerberg remains an active uh, clinician, educator, and researcher uh, in the Division of Cardiology, and we're del delighted that he's here uh, with us uh, for this endowed lecture. Uh, this is, I think, now our seventh uh, annual uh, Meyerberg lecture. So with that, uh, I'll pass it off to Dr. Lloyd to uh, introduce the, our speaker. Hi, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Quentin Lloyd. I'm one of the chief residents here at the Department of Medicine um, at the University of Miami. Um, and today I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Ian Goldberg um, as our grand round speaker today. Um, Dr. Golden Goldberg is a board certified cardiologist, professor of cardiology and director of the Clinical Cardiovascular Research Center at the University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Uh, Dr. Goldenberg completed his medical training at Sackler School of Medicine at Tel Aviv University in Israel and his internal medicine and cardiovascular disease training at Sheba Medical Center. Dr. Goldenberg has, in addition, held several positions in the Israel uh, Defense Forces, including head of medical and secondary medical services, as well as director of Israeli Naval Medical Institute and head of research and development unit in the Israel Navy. Dr. Goldenberg also serves as director of the Department of Cardiology at Lviv Heart Center and director of Israeli Association for Cardiovascular Trials at Sheba Medical Center. Dr. Goldenberg has been a recipient of innumerable granted grant funded research endeavors, including NIH R01 funded grants, looking at prophylactic intraoperative BC ablation in high risk LVAD candidates, blood pressure and outcomes in contemporary LVAD recipients, and ICD um, monitoring to reduce AFib burden after ablation, just to name a few. Dr. Goldenberg, along with his team, has even patented the use of low intensity uh, magnetic field devices for the treatment of cardiac and neurological disorders. Today, we have the honor of having Dr. Gold Goldenberg present on the role of ICDs in the prevention of sudden cardiac death. It is with my greatest, greatest pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Goldenberg to the University of Miami. Dr. Goldenberg, everyone. Hello, do you hear me? Um, it's a really a pleasure and an honor for me to speak uh, for the Meyerberg Lecture. Uh, doc, Dr. Meyerberg is a pioneer in cardiovascular arrhythmia research, device studies, and has collaborated with us at the University of Rochester for many years, especially with Dr. Moss, uh, who established the Clinical Cardiovascular Research Center at the University of Rochester. To extend uh, Dr. Meyerberg's uh, studies and research, I would like to focus today on the role of ICDs, especially for primary prevention, indications for primary prevention, importantly, risk stratification in contemporary patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, and outcomes in this population. I will begin by providing the current indication for primary prevention ICD therapy that, as you will see, are based upon clinical LADMA clinical trials that were conducted more than 20 years ago in patients with ischemic heart failure, ischemic cardiomyopathy, patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then I will, will proceed to discuss the potential benefit, but also limitations of prophylactic ICD placement in patients, contemporary patients with HFF. Considering the reduction in the rate of appropriate ICD therapy and sudden cardiac death over the past 20 years, the possible incremental antiarrhythmic potential of four-pillar GDMT, including ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors, and the, also the incremental antiarrhythmic protection of cardiac resynchronization therapy. And this data suggests that there's a need for improved recertification for primary ICD implantation, regardless of ejection fraction. I will also touch on future direction, the risk of sudden cardiac death, as Dr. Meyerberg uh, in the past indicated, the majority of patients for sad, who die for sudden cardiac death do not have advanced heart failure. So future indication beyond the ventricular injection fraction, and I will summarize and provide my thoughts on the clinical implications. I will begin 
by discussing the indication for primary ICD implantation, prophylactic ICD place, uh, placement in patients with ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure. As I mentioned, patients with left ventricular ejection fraction, currently ejection fraction equal to or less than 35% in heart failure symptoms are, are currently referred for prophylactic ICD placement for primary prevention of sudden cardiac death. However, those guideline recommendations in both ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy originate from clinical trials that were conducted approximately two decades ago. And this data may not be applicable to current era, to the current era of contemporary heart failure management. And we have in our in the University of Rochester, we run the original MEDIT trials initially in 1996. MEDIT, the original MEDIT study, MEDIT 1, included less than 200 patients. And we have shown a survival benefit in patients with ejection fraction less than 30% who have a positive EP study in the range of more than 40%. Subsequently, MEDI2 included patients with ejection function below 30, regardless of actual heart failure functional class, again, showing a significant survival benefit during long-term follow-up and short-term follow-up. And also, subsequently, the MEDI-CRT trial showed a further reduction and improvement in the risk of death and improvement in survival with cardiac resynchronization therapy. So what are the indications for primary prevention ICD therapy in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy? We have actually have two landmark clinical trials that were conducted again more than about 20 years ago. The first one was MEDI-2. In this study, we included patients with ischemic heart failure, patients post-MI patients with an ejection fraction less than 30% with a New York Heart Association factor class one, two, or three. So regardless of heart failure symptoms. And this study has shown a significant 31% reduction in the risk of death associated with ICD versus at the time it was called conventional, but currently it is non-ICD therapy. The second study published in 2005 was CARDEFT. SCADEFT included both ischemic and non-ischemic heart failure patients and patients with ejection function that was equal to less than 35%, but only those who were symptomatic, heart failure functional class two or three. In this study, there was an overall 23 reduction in the risk of all-cause mortality or survival benefit associated with ICD versus non-ICD therapy, and the reduction in the risk of death in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is a subgroup analysis of this study, was 21%, Again, p-value is 0.05, but this is a subgroup analysis. So those are the two landmark clinical trials that showed a survival benefit associated with ICD therapy in patients with ischemic heart failure. A meta-analysis that includes all trials of ischemic heart failure of ICD versus non-ICD therapy shows an overall 90% reduction in the risk of death. Again, this is driven by MEDI-2 and SCADEF. Based on this, US guidelines, HA, SEC, and HRS guidelines provide a class one recommendation for ICD placement in patients with ejection function that is equal to less than 35% who have symptomatic heart failure, functional class two or three, this is a class one indication that also the MEDI-2 population, patients of asymptomatic heart failure, ischemic cardiomyopathy, with ejection fraction that is equal to or less than 30%. The European guidelines are somewhat different. They still provide a class one recommendation for patients who are symptomatic heart failure, ejection fraction that is equal to or less than 35%, but a class 2A indication, a less stringent recommendation for those who are asymptomatic with ejection fraction below 30. What about non-ischemic heart failure? In this population, we only have two landmark, again, two landmark clinical trials. None of them shown, showed a statistically significant survival benefit, but again, this may be, may be limited by the number of events in those studies, because as you know, patients with non-ischemic heart failure have an overall lower mortality risk. But still, 
the trend and the magnitude of reduction was 27% in a subgroup analysis of the SCADEF trial and 35% reduction in the risk of death in a definite trial. The most recent trial that evaluated the benefit of the ICD in patients with an ischemic heart failure was the Danish trial. This trial was somewhat complicated because it became, it was conducted after the advent of cardiac resynchronization therapy. So as you see, we have four arms to the trial. We have patients already at a pre-existing CRT, patients who had an indication for CRT, and patients who had an indication for an ICD or randomized to ICD versus non-ICD therapy. Overall, the study did not show a statistically survival benefit of the ICD in this population. Again, this finding may be limited by the sample size, but also by the fact that there were actually CRT, non-CRT patients, so it was a somewhat complicated design, and also the number of patients, because as you see, until five years, there is a trend to still a survival benefit, and then the curves course over. Regardless, the study showed that there was statistically significant reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death with an ICD of, in a magnitude of 50%. But again, this finding did not translate into an overall survival benefit of the ICD in the Danish trial. Importantly, the Danish trial also performed subgroup analysis and showed that the survival benefit of the ICD was more pronounced in younger patients as opposed to, opposed to an older population in which the comp competing risk of non-horrific mortality may be higher. And actually, in some countries in Europe, including Denmark, the, these findings were implemented, and now ICDs are being implanted only in patients at a younger age who have non-ischemic heart failure. But again, if we do a, a meta-analysis and include all randomized clinical trials, including the Danish trial, we still, see, we still see a statistically significant 25% reduction in the risk of death associated with primary RCD implantation in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And again, this magnitude is somewhat higher even that was a, than, the, than the one that was observed in patients with ischemic heart failure. So U.S. guidelines still provide, they are more conservative and still provide a class one recommendation based on the day, on the SCADEF trial and the results of definite in patients with ischemic, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy in ejection fraction that is equal to less than 35% who have symptomatic heart failure, NYHA class two or three. In contrast, the European guidelines still take into account the results of the DENI trial and you reduce the level of indication of ICD in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy to a level of 2A. So still indication, but still indicating that there are conflicting data on the benefit of the ICD, the survival benefit of the ICD in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. However, again, those studies were conducted, the lung clinical trial that showed the survival benefit were conducted about 20 years ago. Today, there's a lot of contemporary data showing a reduction in the risk of appropriate ICD therapy and sudden cardiac death in patients who are treated medically with HFRS. And we see that even in the lung clinical trials, it made it to, in the definite trial and in SCADEF, the rate of appropriate ICD therapy life-saving therapy during three to four years of follow-up was 30%. So actually, even in those trials, more than 70% of the population did not receive life-saving therapy from the device, suggesting a need for improved risk certifications, even in patients with a low ejection fraction. Over the past 20 years, with the advent of more advanced GDMT for HFREF, we have seen a reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death across clinical trials, and those trials not even include the SGLT2 trials that were published more recently. We have also shown in a contemporary population 
in the Israeli population a publication in Hot Rhythm that the rate of apartheid ICD shocks, the yearly rate of apartheid ICD shocks in contemporary heart failure patients is only 1%, whereas the rate of inappropriate therapy is close to 5%, again suggesting a need for improved risk certification for primary ICD implantation in patients with a low ejection fraction. And we see that there's a reduction in the rate of appropriate ICD therapy in patients who have contemporary and contemporary heifer patients for 5% in SCADF, 5.4% in prepared trial, 3% in medit RIT with more advanced programming for ICD intervention, and 1% in contemporary real world patients in ICD registry patients. And this is our data from the landmark medit trials. We also see that there's a reduction in the risk of VTVF, appropriate ICD intervention for life threatening VTVF in a heart rate that is equal to uh, then or greater than 200 beats per minute in the rate of all cause mortality, sudden cardiac death, and even non sudden cardiac death with an ICD. One important consideration despite the survival benefit that I showed, is that there are also ICD-related major adverse events, including device-related complications. In the more contemporary Praetorian trial, the rate of device-related complications, lead complications, systemic infections, were approximately 10% of three years of follow-up. The rate of inappropriate shocks in patients with transvenous devices were more than 5% of three years of follow-up. And we have also shown in a postdoc analysis of the MEDI2 trial, that the survival benefit and the reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death transforms into an increase in the risk of, a, of hospitalization for heart failure. So when we do, when we do shared decision making in the risk of ICD and the benefit and risk of ICD implantation in patients who are indicated for primary prevention, those considerations should also be taken into account. Now, there's also the option of more advanced novel GDMT for heart failure that has not been fully implemented in patients in the US, but still those drugs have been shown to be associated with significant survival benefit in this population, regardless of the presence of an ICD. The four pillar GDMT recommended today for patients with HFRF include ARNI, SGLT2 inhibitors that were not implemented in landmark ICD trials, MRAs were implemented in approximately 25% of these populations 20 years ago, and beta blockers in 70 to 80% of the patients. Also, optimization of GDMT doses is crucial in this population before we proceed with device intervention. And we see that ARNI, based on the paradigm in AF, AF trial, heart failure trial, HF trial, was associated with significant reduction, 20% reduction in the risk of death from cardiovascular causes, and a significant 60% reduction in the risk of all-cause mortality, again, regardless of the presence of an ICD. Furthermore, SGLT2 inhibitors are also associated with a significant, almost 20% reduction in the risk of death from cardiovascular causes, and the survival benefit. Again, regardless of the presence of an ICD. We also see that SGLT2 inhibitors were associated with a significant reduction in the risk of serious ventricular arrhythmias, resuscitated cardiac arrest, and cytocardiac death. So contemporary SGDMT for the management of HFREF also have, have been shown to be associated with significant reduction in life-threatening ventricular tachyarrhythmias and a reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is also applicable to Entresto. ARNI have also been shown to be associated with a reduction in the risk of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death, a 20% reduction. However, as I mentioned, 4-pillar GDMT is not currently implemented in all of our patients. And we see that ARNI is implemented in less than 20% of the patients and only 1% are optimally dosed on ARNI. 
MRAs, the situation is similar. So there's a need for better treatment and management of HFRF patients before considering device therapy. In a recent analysis of the CHAMP HF registry, we see that if we implement the 4-Gpilo GDMT, there's an incremental survival benefit, more than 60% reduction in the risk of, 70% reduction, 60% actually reduction in the risk of all-cause mortality associated with 4-Pilo GDMT compared with not implementing all four drugs. To better understand the survival benefit in, of the ICD in contemporary heart failure patients, we carried out a subgroup analysis of the emperor reduced trial. In this study, we did a propensity score matching of patients in the placebo arm of the trial who were not treated with SGLT2 inhibitors to ICD versus not ICD therapy, and in the empagliflozin arm of the trial, again, propensity score match patients of ICD versus non-ICD therapy. And surprisingly, contrary to what we have expected that um, SGLT2 inhibitors will provide a further reduction, we do not see a survival benefit of the ICD in contemporary heart failure patients of ICD versus non-ICD, both treated with placebo and those who are treated with empagliflozin. Again, suggesting that improved heart failure management, regardless of implementation of SGLT2 inhibitors, may reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death to such an extent that ICD therapy may not be associated with survival benefit in this contemporary population. However, again, this is a subgroup analysis and a post scope analysis of the emperor reduced trial. Cardiac risk condensation therapy may also provide anti protection. We have shown in the MEDIT CRT trial that among patients with left pantograph block, Treatment with cardiac risk condensation therapy versus ICD therapy is associated with a significant more than 30% reduction in the risk of death with an NNT of 9. And also, the device was associated with significant and pronounced more than 50% reduction in the risk of non fatal heart failure events. But importantly, in patients without LBBB, those findings were not observed. And furthermore, we have shown that among patients with LBBB, treatment with cardiac risk therapy also has antiarrhythmic properties, showing a significant reduction in the risk of VTVF versus ICD alone in patients with LBBB, as opposed to an increase in the burden of VTVF in patients without LBBB. So among patients with HFREF who have LBBB, treatment with CRTD may also reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death and ventricular arrhythmias, regardless of the presence of an ICD, suggesting that possibly some patients may be indicated for CRTP devices, which is cardiac resynchronization therapy without a defibrillator. So to summarize, there are several potential mechanisms leading to reduced rate of appropriate ICD therapy in reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death that suggests that currently there is a need to evaluate the survival benefit of prophylactic ICD placement in all patients with advanced heart failure. And these include improved rates of coronary vascularizations, which have over, over the years caused and be, were associated with a change in the arrhythmic substrate, a more defined scar, improved management of avular disease, aortic intervention, mitral clip, improve implementation of standard GDMT even before the advent of ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors, implementation of novel GDMT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, and also, as I mentioned, changes the device programming currently to a high rate cutoff that eliminated a lot of the unnecessary therapy and even inappropriate therapy associated with primary acid implantation. And all this data suggests a need for improved recertification for primary ICD implantation. And this was actually suggested by our colleagues, um, by Dr. Meyerberg, Arthur Moss, and Dr. Goldberger in a landmark publication several years ago, 
suggesting that there's an opportunity for improved prevention and risk notification in this population. Even in the, based on the MEDI trial that have shown that the majority of patients did not derive life-saving therapy with the device, we already started to try and attempt to provide risk notification for primary implantation in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. In this study, we identified five simple clinical markers of increased risk for all-cause mortality in patients who were not treated with an ICD. More advanced heart failure symptoms, the presence of atrial fibrillation, a wider QRS duration, an older age, and elevated BUN levels. Patients who did not have any of those risk factors had a very low rate and risk of death regardless of the presence of an ICD. Patients who had one or more of those risk factors had increased risk of all, risk of all cause mortality. And in this population, ICD was associated with a survival benefit. Whereas very high risk patients with advanced renal dysfunction and comorbidities at such a high rate of death that ICD was no longer beneficial, a survival, a, a mortality rate of almost 60% at six years among those who had advanced renal failure and comorbidities. And these findings suggest a U shaped benefit for the ICD. Patients who have a very low in the patients who have advanced heart failure symptom, uh, advanced level ventricular dysfunction. Patients with a very low risk of death will not derive a survival benefit from the ICD. Patients who had advanced comorbidities and advanced renal failure will also have a higher mortality rate regardless of the presence of the ICD, whereas patients who have one or more, one or more of those risk factors are more likely to derive a survival benefit from the ICD. But again, this subgroup analysis was based on the MEDI trial that was published again more than 20 years ago. A similar analysis based on the scad f trial of the Seattle heart failure model, again suggesting that among patients who are intermediate risk from an ICD for mortality, those will derive the greatest benefit from an ICD as opposed to patients who have advanced comorbidities. To further evaluate the benefit of the ICD in patients with left ventricular dysfunction, Dr. Goldberger in our group carried out a more contemporary study to evaluate the predicted benefit of the ICD. And in this study, we developed the Medit ICD benefit score. And this study was published a year ago in the European Heart Journal. In this study, we hypothesize that improved selection for primary ICD implantation can be achieved by weighing the patient-specific risk of life-threatening events for which an ICD obviously may be life-saving against the competing risk of non-horrific mortality for which, for which primary ICD implantation will not provide protection. And accordingly, we developed and externally validated, we developed the score based on the MEDI trial and externally validated the score based on real population and more contemporary device studies and developed a personalized ICD benefit score based on the distribution of the two competing risks, the risk of ETVF and the risk of non-horrific mortality. And this novel MEDI ICD benefit score predicts the likelihood of prophylactic ICD benefit for assessment of the risk of life-threatening VT, VTA, ventricular attack arrhythmic events, weighted against the risk of non-horrific mortality. The score was developed on, based on the landmark MEDI trials, MEDI-2, MEDI-CRT, the more contemporary medi rt population, the medi risk study, and was validated in the contemporary rate trial, but also in contemporary real-world patients who are treated with novel GDMT. The total cohort comprised more than 4,500 patients with an ICD. And we see that we identified again very simple clinical risk factors for life threatening ventricular arrhythmias, a low ejection fraction, the presence of history of atrial arrhythmia, a faster heart rate, a lower blood pressure, ischemic cardiomyopathy or previous myocardial infarction, a younger age, male sex, and a history of prior non-sustained VT that were identified in Holter. 
We also identified several comorbidities that may increase the risk of non-anorexic mortality in this population, including more advanced heart failure symptoms, diabetes, a low BMI, possibly cardiac apexia, a, a low ejection fraction, and an older age. And taken together, we developed the score, and the score identified patients are more likely to be derive benefit from the ICD, and those who are low, low likelihood to derive, derive benefit from the ICD. And we see that patients with the highest likelihood to derive benefit have a high risk of ventricular tachyarrhythmia for life-threatening events, uh, life-threatening ventricular tachyarrhythmia. But in this population, the risk of non-horrific mortality is low. And on the other hand, patients at the lowest group, the lowest benefit from the ICD, have the highest risk of non horrific mortality and the lowest, lowest risk of VTA. And if we look at the three groups separately, we see that the patients who are the highest benefit of the ICD, we see that the risk of VTVF significantly exceeds the risk of non horrific mortality. In patients in the intermediate group, this difference is still present but is attenuated. In patients at the lowest benefit, there is no statistically significant difference between the risk of non arrhythmic mortality and the risk of arrhythmic events, suggesting that in this subset of patients, the potential benefit of the ICD is significantly attenuated. And this data currently can be used again for shared decision making in patients because now this is a class one recommendation. Patients who are candidate for primacy ICD implantation, they should also discuss, the clinicians should also discuss the risk associated with the device and the potential benefit of the device in this population. But as Dr. Meyerberg suggested in the past, the risk of sudden cardiac death is even actually the numerical patients who died from sudden cardiac death is higher beyond current indication for primary CD implantation. And this is the famous figure showing that the number of sudden cardiac death is actually higher among patients who do not have advanced cardiac dysfunction, ejection function below 35%. So there's a need for improved selection of patients for primary ICD implantation beyond ejection function. However, because the risk of sudden cardiac death, not the rate, but the risk is relatively low, we do not believe that only ejection function, or only one simple clinical marker can delineate which patients will be indicated from the device. And this is our proposal in our publication in a review of the ICD indications currently in the future, suggesting that in this population, there should be combined assessment of clinical markers, including age, heart failure functional class, a prior history of hospitalization, renal function, arrhythmic history, and comorbidities like we discussed from the, from the Medit ICD benefit score, we also should rely on genetic markers for sudden cardiac death, but also imaging impo is important, especially MRIs, MRI with a scar indicated increased likelihood for arrhythmic risk, electrocardiographic markers, and biomarkers. So combined assessment of those parameters in the future may lead us for better risk certification for primary acid implantation in patients regardless of ejection function. A few words on the, on the future of the devices. In, medit, in the first MEDI trials, actually the ICDs were implanted at the beginning of the trial surgically. So they needed an open heart surgery to implant an ICD. Subsequently, devices involved into transvenous devices with several complications. Today, we still have the option of subcutaneous ICD that are more evolved despite of some of the limitations. But currently, there's also completely trans extravascular devices that are able to provide both pacing and antitachycardia pacing without shocks. They're able, able to communicate with leadless pacing inside the heart. We are able, also able to provide resynchronization therapy without an additional lead using LBBB pacing. So the options for devices in the future will also divide, evolve in parallel with the involvement of indications for an ICD implantation beyond ejection fraction. <laughs>
So to summarize, we have seen that current guidelines for primary acid replacement may not be applicable in contemporary patients with heparin. We have seen that more than 70% of the patients who were enrolled in landmark clinical trials, even trials that were conducted more than 20 years ago, did not receive appropriate ICD therapy in this population. There has been a further reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death and appropriate ICD intervention rates over the past 20 years. Newer GDMT, including ARNI and SGLT2 inhibitors, may further result in a reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death and life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias beyond what we have seen in the past. In addition, cardiac resynchronization therapy has resulted in further reduction in the risk of arrhythmic risk. And also, when we discuss device intervention with our patients, there's also the trade-off of device-related complications. So we should still follow guidelines, but take those consideration into account when we discuss the shared decision-making with our patients. We believe that currently, recertification for primary acid implantation, regardless of ejection fraction, should take into account the competing risk of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias versus non-arrhythmic mortality that are associated with personalized selection in a patient with more advanced comorbidities. So prior to a decision for primary acid implantation, we believe that all patients, and this is the critical point, all patients should be stable with optimal contemporary GDMT because this is just a few words in the guidelines. But we, uh, we as clinicians need to take it uh, to the fullest extent. Before considering the patients for primary acid implantation, all patients should be optimized with the four-pillar GDMT when the patients are able to tolerate that on optimal doses. And following that, we should document ejection fraction that is equal to less than 35%. Following this, if the patient is still fully optimized with a low ejection fraction, we should implement shared decision-making, especially in our patients with more advanced comorbidities in which we believe that the risk of non-arrhythmic mortality exceeds the risk, the risk of arrhythmic death. In these patients, and in selected patients, this is something that has been implemented more in Europe than in the US, we should consider CRTP devices, cardiac resynchronization therapy, especially in patients with LBBB without a defibrillator that have less complications and have more cost-effectiveness implications. And in the future, we believe that the role of primary prevention ICD implantation should be beyond ejection fraction. It should incorporate a multidisciplinary approach to decision-making. Thank you again. And, uh, this talk is open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg. That was an excellent grand rounds and appreciate the clarity and um, the methodologic uh, approaches that, that you gave us. One of the challenges, and you're one of the kings of clinical trials, is recruiting um, diverse populations into a clinical trial. So what, might, what comment might you have regarding the generalizability of the recommendations, specifically as regard to uh, white versus non-white patients, males versus females, are there any conclusions that can be made at this point? Yeah, I agree with you. What we have seen in landmark clinical trials, they do not represent the distribution of patients in the general population. But we, what we did was we combined the data and we looked at women and we looked at African-American and Black patients enrolled in the MEDI trials, and actually we have seen that in women, the risk of ETVF is somewhat lower, but it's still derive a survival benefit from the ICD. And in African-American and Black patients, the risk of ventricular arrhythmia is higher. We are now struggling with this issue. We are now approaching the NIH, and we got pre-approval for a new landmark clinical trial exactly to aim to target patients who receive contemporary management for GDMT for HFREF and randomize them based on the benefit, ICD benefit score, those are of a low likelihood to get benefit to ICD versus not ICD therapy. And we're trying to enroll diverse populations and we're trying to identify measures to address copay issues in this population before enrollment. So this is something that should be 
stressed in all clinical trials because we believe that findings need to be applicable to real world patients. Otherwise, we'll make those guidelines, but they will not be applicable to the general population. So this is a good point. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Dr. Goldberger, you unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? Um, sure, that was a uh, wonderful presentation. So I, my, you sort of began to answer my question already, which is how you translate uh, the individualized approach into the general population. But it, it, it sounds like uh, doing a clinical trial would be a wonderful way to, uh, to bring that data to the forefront. Uh, what, 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 what's the anticipated uh, time scale for that? Um, for this specific trial, um, for this specific trial, we report. I'm hearing my echo. Um, I'm hearing my echo. Um, maybe you try to mute. Uh, try yeah, to mute. mute your... um, so for this specific trial, we approached the NIH, and there's a parallel one. I mean, the steering committee another study that is going on in Europe. So this trial is a really, we believe, it's an unmet need because right now contemporary patients with heart failure we do not believe that all patients derive a survival benefit so there's a one going parallel in europe that we are but we are approaching for a global clinical trial and it got pre-approval for the nih and we're trying to implement it in, in a diverse population we're trying to find ways to address copay issues in a real world population and the timeline is we are now submitting the application in november it's going to be discussed in the in February, we wanted to start the study in the in the summer, and this is something that I want you to discuss with you tomorrow when we meet to collaborate in this study as part of the steering committee. Wonderful, Dr. Mendez, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question from the chat? Yeah, hi, I'm an MP fellow. I'm just curious about the risk stratification model, if. Um, could elaborate a little more on the importance of a strain echo since the GLS, uh, global longitudinal strain from um, strain echo analysis could provide information on subclinical cardiac dysfunction. Oh, th this is a very important point. We looked at that and you're welcome to work with us. We have an extensive database on echo and for medit CRT. And we actually identified that this is an important marker for ventricular arrhythmic risk in this population. However, we want it in this specific risk certification model that we developed with Dr. Goldenberg, Goldberger, we wanted to focus on simple, simple clinical markers that are readily available to all clinicians. So we focused on age, NYHA class, sex, and uh, ejection fraction and heart failure function class. But beyond that, I believe this is important. And this is something that I also mentioned that we now we're working, and this is another NIH, NIH application in which we want to identify whether those more sophisticated imaging markers, genetic markers, biomarkers will be able to risk stratify patients uh, for the risk of sudden cardiac death and ICD implantation, combined assessment beyond ejection function. Thank you. I see Dr. Meyerberg is in the audience. Bob, do you want to, do you have a question or a comment? You're on mute. You're still on mute. I got it. It's on now. Okay. Now, what I was saying, I really enjoyed the presentation. It was really covered the things that he and I and others have done <laughs> through the years, and it was very, um, very well done. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meyerberg, for your uh, namesake being used for this terrific Grand Round series. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Goldenberg, for giving such an erudite Grand Rounds, and Dr. Goldberger for inviting our speaker today. I thank everybody for participating, and please pay attention to the chat for the CME tracker where you can click and get, uh, and get credit for today's uh, Grand Rounds. I look forward to seeing everybody next week and wish you all good health and happiness in the coming days. Be well. <laughs>
Thank you, everybody. Thank you.